Air Station Clearwater, just north of St. Petersburg, Florida. It's one of the largest and most active Coast Guard air stations in the country. We've seen how aircraft maintenance is so critical to Air Station Clearwater, just as it is at all air stations. Crews work round the clock to keep the aircraft and rescue equipment in top condition. But the best equipment in the world won't help if you don't know how to use it. That's where training comes in. Consistent training keeps the flight crew's skills honed and critical techniques second nature during an emergency. At Air Station Clearwater, flight training and water survival training are all ongoing. Crews also need to be prepared for situations where they end up in the water. If a helo malfunctions and goes down, it immediately flips over. The rotors make it top heavy. Air crews need to know how to exit or egress out of the helo when it's underwater. They also need to know how to use their survival gear once they're afloat. I'm a small instructor. And also, on every wet drill once a month, I teach the, um, show the, the, the crew members the power techs that we have here that they have in their vest for, um, for life saving. In the event of an emergency, crew members use flares or smoke to signal their location. They learn to use this equipment appropriately so that they're prepared to signal for assistance and remain safe while they wait for help to arrive. Please do not aim this at the aircraft. Okay, because everybody will start getting nervous. Who's next? As we've seen, Coast Guard personnel train and maintain their aircraft and equipment on a daily basis. But they're also always search and rescue or SAR ready. A call comes in to Air Station Clearwater. The Elliot, a 600-foot motor vessel, reports that one of its crew members has fallen overboard. 400 miles west-southwest of Miami, which is down the Yucatan, uh, channel, the motor vessel Elliot reported a man overboard. This is the position. They actually observed him going overboard, so the position's good. Uh, he had no flotation on. Uh, they threw some at him, but they don't think that he got it. And last time they saw him, uh, he was about a mile away from the ship wearing gray overalls. And the call was from district trying to figure out if the C-130 thought that they could be effective trying to find this guy tonight. Uh, and they said, you know, if he didn't have any illumination, you know, with him, then they wouldn't be able to uh, be that effective at night. So they're planning on a first light search. The guy's got gray overalls on, no, signaling, uh, no signaling device. And I said, uh, told him on the phone that uh, if we got out there and the Epsilon 37 picked him up, that we're not going to see anything uh, to verify what the target is. A first light search means that the C-130 departs at 5 a.m. It's 4.30 a.m. And while the pilots review their flight plan and their track spacing or search pattern, the crew is doing the final preps on the plane. The pilots then do their final check, and they're ready to head out. While the C-130 is en route, another vessel in the area spots the man and throws him a life ring. The air crew is very encouraged by this news. Once on scene, they begin their search pattern. The flight crew spots the life ring, but unfortunately, the life ring is empty. They continue searching, hoping to find the man nearby and alive. Finally, after hours of searching, and running low on fuel, 
the discouraged air crew heads back to the air station. Even with all their hard work, long hours, and rigorous training, this is the toughest part of any search and rescue job, when you search but don't find the victim. Might have been splashing around, but it could have been a white cap, as far as we knew. The uh, vessel out there had a positive sighting of the uh, PIW. It was real frustrating because it, it pumped everybody up, uh, a lot of adrenaline flowing. We went over and uh, relocated what they had thrown out to mark that position where they saw uh, where they saw them from and thought for sure we'd be able to relocate. And uh, when we couldn't, it was uh, extremely frustrating from that point. Uh, I'll tell you about it when we get home. Real frustrating. Uh, no. The boat uh, that we were, we uh, diverted over there, said he saw it. And so we were right on top of the boat practically uh, when, uh, when he called out that he had thrown a life ring out to a person in the water. So we relocated the life ring just minutes after that and uh, started flying right over that position. We flew over that position probably 150, 200 times. Never saw him. The boats, two boats are out there that uh, one, the one that he fell off of and another one that volunteered to help. And uh, they're both, uh, both searching right now, but uh, we came on back. We uh, ran out of gas and came home.